There's a story uh, uh, Douglas Adam once wrote. He wrote down his account of a real encounter that he had one day at a train station, and this story is titled Cookies. I'm going to read it for you. This actually did happen to a real person, and the real person is me. I had gone to catch a train. This was April 1976 in Cambridge, UK. I was a bit early for the train because I had gotten the time of the train wrong. So I went to get myself a newspaper to do a crossword and a cup of coffee and a packet of cookies. I went and sat at a table, and I want you to picture this scene. It has to be very clear in your mind. Here's the table, here's my newspaper, cup of coffee, packet of cookies. There was also a guy sitting opposite of me at the table, perfectly ordinary looking gentleman wearing a business suit, carrying a briefcase. And it didn't look like he was going to do anything weird or out of the ordinary, but he did. What he did was this. He suddenly leaned across, picked up the packet of cookies, tore it open, took one out, ate it, and set the packet down. Now this, I have to say, is the sort of thing that the British are very bad at dealing with. There's nothing in our background or upbringing or education that teaches us how to deal with someone who has just stolen our cookie. Now you know what would happen if this had been South Central Los Angeles. There would have been quickly been gunfire. There would have been helicopters. CNN would have done a story on it. You know, but in the end, I did the red-blooded English, red Englishman thing to do. I ignored it. So I stared at the newspaper, took a sip of coffee, and tried to do a clue in the newspaper and ignore it. But I couldn't because I kept thinking, what am I going to do next? In the end, I thought, nothing. I'll just, I'll just act like nothing happened. And so I tried very hard not to notice that the fact that the, the packet was already mysteriously opened, and I reached in and took a cookie for myself. I thought, that settles that, and assumed the man would leave my cookies alone. But he didn't. He reached in, and he took another cookie. We went through the whole packet like this. He took a cookie, I took a cookie, and when I say the whole packet, I mean that there was only about eight cookies, but it seemed like an entire lifetime. Finally, when we got to the end of the pack of cookies, he stood up, and after we exchanged, should I say, meaningful looks, he walked away, and I breathed a sigh of relief and sat back. A moment or two later, the train was coming in, so I tossed back the rest of my coffee. I stood up, picked up my newspaper, and underneath the newspaper were my cookies. Unwrapped, uneaten. Now, the thing I particularly like about this story is that the sensation that there's someone somewhere in England that has been wandering around for the last quarter of a century, perfectly ordinary guy who said the same exact story with no punchline. <laughs> so the next time you're convinced that you know everything and that you are right, make sure to check under your newspaper first. You might just be missing something. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about worldview today. Um, we've been on this topic of God and race, and Derek did an incredible job last week of kind of setting the stage and the foundation for the thoughts we're going to explore um, biblically. And, uh, you know, we all have these paradigms, these lenses that we view life through and the way that we see, uh, the way that we understand what we see. And it's obvious that our world is in turmoil. And it seems that all of the systems that we see in place uh, have rejected what God's word says about things. And because of this, they actually, it's, it's interesting because they wonder why they can't bring meaningful answers to the issues of life. Things like Rabbi Zacharias, he, he brings up the four issues of life. Origin, where do we come from? Meaning, why are we here? Morality, what's right and wrong? And destiny, where are we going when we die? And the secular world struggles to answer these questions, but the biblical worldview does not. We have to understand that the Bible is not simply a book on spiritual things or relationships or how to uh, do things right. It is a history book, and it is a rich, detailed history book revealed by a God who knows everything. Um, so we as the church, we want to have a right worldview. We want to have the right lenses on as we look at the issues that we face in our culture. And it's important that we start with the Word of God and build our thinking on the full counsel of the Word of God. You've heard this term, world view. Somebody, certain people have certain world views. You have a certain world view, whether you like it or not. It's not something you decide to have. It's just something that's programmed into you uh, because of the things that you believe and understand. 
Um, and they are the, it is the foundation of our thinking and informs the way we understand what's going on in the world. It's also important to mention here that there are many, many dangerous worldviews. Um, and that honestly, they just seem to dominate the horizon. Um, it's just a, such a secular world. Some of these that you've heard of um, are evolution is a common one. It's taught in our schools. Atheism, naturalism, humanism, and these are dangerous. They do not contain the moral authority necessary to bring resolution to the important conflicts we see in our society, and there are many. Um, throughout this series, again, we've been focusing on race, and so we're trying to figure out what the full counsel of God says uh, about race. I do want to address something that Derek brought up last week, and obviously we know the history of slavery within the American culture. Um, it's, it's wrong, and, and Derek brought up the fact that there were actually a lot of Christian figures, people who held Christian office, uh, that used scripture to affirm racism, to affirm slavery and say that it was a biblical thing or that it was a right thing. And I just want to say a couple things about it. Um, you can't judge Christianity by those who misrepresent it. You can't judge Christianity by those people who misrepresent it. And sadly, there are people who wield the word of God in ways that are damaging, in ungodly ways. And that happens because they're embracing half-truths. They're cherry-picking what they want to use, and they don't do a, a comprehensive study of the Bible and say, what's God's heart on this issue? They take these phrases, much like the media does with, in every realm, right? And we have this skewed view, and they wrong view. And it causes people to act in ways that are not godly while using the gospel or the word of God to prove the way they're acting and to condone it. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to say that, that, you know, we, it happens often. People ask that all the time. Well, Christians have persecuted more people throughout history or as much as any other uh, group of people. And it's like, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but those people are misrepresenting scripture when they do that. Um, people usually fall into false beliefs when they don't take the whole counsel of God. The word, itself to sh uh, the word itself tells us to show ourselves approved and to study diligently. We have to understand this book is not simply a book of do's and don'ts. It's so much more. It's in-depth and nuanced. Not only does it tell us that certain actions are wrong morally, but the scripture tells us uh, the scripture says about itself, which, which is said so beautifully, it says the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and get this, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it's not just a book that says, hey, don't go murder people, don't go be angry with people. It judges the intents of your heart. And it says, yeah, you may not be murdering people, but the way that you're feeling inside is just as wrong. Right? Um, let me get my place here. Uh, honestly, that's, that's a big conversation. We could stay there for a while, but I, I, we need to move on and, and, and kind of stay focused on this issue of racism. I want to just bring up a few uh, historical accounts of, of where we see race seen racism in its most extreme forms, kind of identify it there, and then work backwards into some of, more its, of its more subtle forms. Uh, one of the instances that we see in history, a lot of us know this, we were taught this in, his, in uh, school, is Nazi Germany and Hitler. Uh, Hitler, if you didn't know, was an extreme and radical evolutionist. That was the basis of his thinking, that some people are better than others, some people are more evolved. And we saw millions of Jews be uh, annihilated in that name of evolution or under the banner of evolution. Nazi Germany was actually taking, uh, their, taking Norwegian women and they would force them to have babies with their SS soldiers because they were trying to create a superior race. They thought, okay, if apes' skin is dark, light skin must be more evolved. If apes' skin or hair is dark and eyes are dark, then light hair and light eyes must be more evolved. They were trying to create a more superior race and through that uh, committed horrible genocide towards other races. 
Oda Binga, if you've never heard of him, he was a young black man. And uh, people thought that he was the missing link and they put him in a zoo, literally, with monkeys. And people would come by and see him on display. People would say, look, this is the missing link, proving evolution. Finally, uh, some people got him out through legal means. Two years later, he committed suicide. The Aborigines, if you've never heard of them, they're people in, in uh, Australia. This was, these were primarily black people. Bushmen, uh, people from other countries were hired to come in and to hunt the aborigines down, to kill them, to shove them off cliffs, to herd them like animals. Some of their bodies were even dug up, and a, and a lot of the bodies were even sent off across the ocean to other countries and put in museums on display, claiming this is the missing link. This is the missing link. And obviously we are very familiar with slavery within the U.S. Um, this is not just a U.S. problem. This is a man problem. This is a sinful man problem, and it's been around forever. forever. Um, I'm going to mention as a side point, same thing happens with abortion, um, because what evolution does is it takes certain classes of humans, and it dehumanizes them. It makes them less human. And if we dehumanize a people group, we can treat them and kill them anytime we want and in any way we want. And that's the same argument that has been going on in abortion for years, trying to figure out when does it become a baby in the womb, right? It's a level of dehumanization so that we can act in the way that we want to act. The point is this, that history teaches us a lot. And again, the Bible is also an incredible history book. So let's, let's kind of move into our topic here. I wanted to kind of set the stage and say, yeah, we, we see racism. We see it in its most extreme forms, and we're going to see what the Bible has to say. And I, and I, I do focus on evolution. Just know that I, I focus on evolution a little bit uh, throughout this talk, as you've heard, because evolution is what's being taught in our schools. You know, when the schools, when the public schools kicked out the Bible and they threw the Bible out, they didn't throw out religion. They threw out Christianity. And they replaced it with atheism, which is undergirded by evolution. We need to understand that, and we need to be watchful and mindful of that. Um, today we're going to focus on the topic we've been given is the Tower of Babel. It's popularly known as Tower of Babel. If you were in Australia, you would pronounce it the Tower of Babel. But in keeping with the American tradition and rejecting what the rest of the world does, even coming up with our own measurement system, we're going to pronounce the Tower of Babel. Amen. Babel. <laughs> um, a lot of people know the Tower of Babel is known as the origin of so-called races. I say so-called races because, as we're going to see today, there is only one race. That's the human race. And that's the biblical worldview. Again, what we're doing here today is to try to align our thoughts and our thinking with what the Bible says. Think, thoughts create feelings. We get our thoughts right, our feelings become right, we love better, we love like God. So that's the point, is to be conformed in His image and our thinking. The institutionalization of this idea that there are different races is not only wrong from a biblical perspective, but even secular science endorses and has found out that at a biological level, there's one race. We're all one race. Um, it's funny, uh, a lot of evolutionists will say, okay, well, we came from, uh, you know, common ancestors. But you, you guys ever watch Bill Nye growing up? Anybody? Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill, Bill, Bill. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. We used to watch that growing up. He is a staunch evolutionist, and there's uh, now videos all over the internet of him debating uh, creation scientists like Ken Ham, which I would encourage you to delve into. This stuff is just really interesting. Um, but there's a short clip that's out on YouTube that shows him saying that he believes that, I, I can't even explain it. Basically, asteroids hit the Earth, Martians came to Earth, and we're descendants of Martians. And yet they call this idea that there's a God that created us in his image crazy. Right? I mean, either way you look at it, there had to be an extreme uh, power that brought us in to being. And we see it as a God 
who created us intentionally. Um, now, when we make a statement like uh, there's only one race, when we, when we say something like that, well, it begs the question, then where did humans come from? Well, they didn't come from Martians. I can tell you that. They came from uh, a common ancestor, and that ancestor was Adam and Eve. I just let the cat out of the bag. You're welcome. <laughs> I want to give you, uh, before we jump into the Tower of Babel, I want to give you just a quick historical overview of Genesis and a timeline, because a lot of times we read the scripture, you know, and we have like a couple chapters here or there, and it's hard for us to keep up with the biblical narrative, what's actually happening, what is the, the story that's weaved through all of these circumstances, what is the Bible overall trying to say? And so in Genesis, we see the first thing where God created the world, and he created Adam and Eve, Okay. Then they had descendants. They had sons and daughters and sons and daughters and sons and daughters and descendants. And then we come to this instance in the Bible called the flood. And this is where God uh, destroyed mankind because of their wicked intentions. He saved eight people, Moses, his wife, their three, his three sons and their wives. He saved them from the flood. And so humanity kind of starts over again right there. And the Bible gives us this long, really long list of Noah's descendants. You should go read it. It's very fun to read <laughs> and from his descendants is where we come to the story of the tower of Babel the people at the tower of Babel um, let's focus on Adam and Eve just for a second uh, God tells us that he created Adam and Eve they had sons and daughters and there's a simple question I have to ask you from a biblical standpoint if all descendants came from one man and one woman how many races are there one there's one race this is easy and yet science has taken years to figure this out. God said it in one sentence. So there's one race, it's called Adam's race. And if there's one race, then every person on earth is a member of Adam's race. Every person. You know what this means? It means that we're literally related. Which, that's scary. I don't care to admit that sometimes. But we are literally related. Related. I grew up in an Assembly of God church. Uh, if any of y'all grew up in AG church, you'd know what I'm saying is true. We used to call everybody brother and sister, brother such and such, sister such and such. And I do that with everybody. One day my wife came up to me and was like, uh, Ian wants to know why you call, called the guy at the gas station brother. Is he really your brother? And I was like, no, it's just, it's just habit. It's just the way I was brought up. But one of the things that God used to change my heart was this concept that we are all related so from a simple biological standpoint there is no way that I can be racist there's no way biblically that allows and makes room for me to to think that I'm better than anyone because we are all interconnected biologically um I always thought, it's a little bit of a testimony, I always thought, I, I use the term brother and sister in church as well. I say, oh, Ken's my brother in Christ. Diana's my sister in Christ. Because there's this idea in this church, church in these, this terminology we have in church, church where when people accept Christ as their Savior, they place their faith, then they are adopted. There's this idea of being adopted into the family of God, right? And you now become brothers and sisters. Steve and Sam and I are brothers and sisters because of our shared common faith in Christ, right? And I always thought about that term and I always looked at other people as outside of that. They weren't my brothers and sisters. And then when I read this, I was like, no, physically, they are. You know what that did for me? It comp I know that sounds simple, but it completely changed my heart towards other people because I started to view people as related to me in the same way that I view my mom and my dad and my sister and I go, that drug head across the street, that neighbor that I don't like, that orphan in Haiti is our brother and sister. And it created within me this capacity to love like I had never been able to love before. Um, I've only shared this with close friends, but I'll share it with you. Uh, I remember in prayer one time I was praying to the Lord and I really felt like he told me you don't love people. And I feel like he was convicting me that I didn't love people. 
And I'll share the rest of my testimony later, but uh, I'll just say that God did not leave me there. He gave me ammunition and truth like this to change my heart and to help me see the way that he sees people. Um, this is really cool to understand that there is one, one race because the Bible tells us to take the gospel to every tribe, nation, and tongue. Never says race. To every tribe, nation, and tongue. So even though the world commonly embraces this idea and this verbiage that there are different races, when the people in the media and the talking heads and people with influence use this verbiage, our response should be, no, there's only one race. It's the human race. And when people use that verbiage, uh, creating segregation, even within our verbiage, we're perpetuating this idea and fueling this idea that there is racism. When under the Bible, when the, the way the world, the Bible views the world, where Jesus views the world, all of that is eliminated. It's a non-issue with God. And when we get online with that, it becomes a non-issue with us. And we love people because they're in the image of God. So here's the main idea. Uh, it'll be on the screens if you're uh, taking notes. The main idea is this. Racism is eliminated only under a biblical worldview. Racism is eliminated only under a biblical worldview because when we subject ourselves to what the Bible says about people, it leaves no room for us to make this type of distinction, this damaging distinction. On the other hand, evolution and the like have built within their framework of belief uh, doctrines that will perpetuate and cannot get rid of this type of prejudice. It only fuels it. Uh, and I think it's interesting, you know, there's so many people that in the world that are claiming scientific high ground. We see it a lot with COVID. Like, oh, everybody's spouting numbers. And I'm honestly, I'm just kind of like my bank account with it. I'm done with it. You know, I'm like, I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> but even secular science proves that this is right. That secular science, there's studies out that show that the differences we see between people groups on the outside are just on the outside. That the differences we see are a very small piece of their genetic makeup. The differences that we see are a very small piece of people's genetic makeup. Most of us are the same. Um, so after Adam and Eve, God created Adam and Eve. There's one race, then his descendants. And that leads us to the story of Noah and the flood. Just a quick synopsis. Uh, if you don't know the story of Noah and the flood, I don't, I don't ever want to assume that you guys, uh, I don't want to just mention something and you guys be like, what, what was he talking about? Um, the, no, the story of Noah and the flood is that uh, God basically looks at humanity and says, man, they are so evil. They only think evil. And God was sad that he created man. It grieved his heart so much. And so he decided to destroy all that he had made. And, and the Bible says that he sent a flood. And it also says that he found one man and his family that were righteous and God-honoring, and that was Noah and his wife and sons. And God instructed them to build an ark, and that's where we get the story of Noah and the ark and the animals being saved, as well as humans. And so in the same way that we saw with Adam and Eve, the population grow, there's kind of this bottleneck that happens with Noah and his wife, and then the population grows again from there because they were saved from the flood. Now this is a beautiful thing and I want you to keep this concept in mind because this is going to be important as we move into the story of the Tower of Babel. It's taken a while. We're going to get there. Don't worry. Genesis 9-1 tells us that God blesses Noah and his sons and says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now this is the same command that God gave Adam and Eve. He said, be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. This is a command and a blessing. It's both. God is giving them the world. It's the same command. So I want you to keep that in principle in mind that we are created to go and subdue the world. And I love that because I'm a man. I love going out and climbing the mountains. Um, I know my wife is the same way. We want to explore the unknown. And so I think there's a piece of that in there. Um, and then we come to the story of, tower, of the Tower of Babel. 
um, and I would say this is where things get interesting, but honestly, the whole book of Gen- Genesis is just incredibly intriguing. So we're going to be reading in chapter 11. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Um, we're going to read verses 1 through 4 at first. It'll also be on the screen um, if you don't have your Bibles. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, which makes sense. We've already said there's this bottleneck at Noah, right? So this is basically just a really, really large family. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And this is where we need to pay attention. Then they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Four things. Let us build a city. Let us build a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed. Those are the four things we need to uh, acknowledge as we move through this book. Um, The first and the last, let us make a city, um, lest we be dispersed, are kind of interrelated. So the first and the fourth is, is this idea that people reject the earth as their dwelling, and they made their own in a city that they designed and built. They rejected the command of God when he told them to fill the earth and have dominion and to subdue it. Instead, they converged and they built their own dwelling. This is a rebellion against God's design. Secondly, they built a tower. This tower is a direct rejection of God himself, not just his commands. This is them choosing to embrace their own made-up, self-centered pagan religion Um, actually astronomy I think uh, was one of the big things that they practiced there I don't know I'm not uh, that educated on the whole deal but they they were practicing pagan religions this was a direct rejection of God as their God thirdly they wanted to make a name for themselves and this is simple who is the only perfect all powerful being in the universe worthy of praise God not us. We're here to glorify his name, not our own. And these could be broken down in in this whole sermon in itself, but we're going to kind of move on because we want to stay focused. But the principle is that they were rejecting every plan that God had for mankind and replaced it with their own. So instead of walking in the blessing and commands of the Lord that he had given them to fill the earth and to enjoy it, they built for themselves a dwelling It was a direct replacement of God and what he wanted to give them. So we also see this throughout the Bible. This is is, uh, them committing what we call idolatry. It's what the Bible calls idolatry. And we see this principle all throughout Scripture. This is is how the fall of man happened. Uh, The same thing happened at Mount Sinai when when, uh, God was giving the people the Ten Commandments. When God was speaking to Moses and giving them the Ten Commandments, the people were down in, at the bottom of the mountain. They, said, they were getting bored, and they said, Men, we're going to build ourselves an idol. And so they built themselves an image. Now, the irony of this, especially since we're talking about racism, is instead of worshiping the God that led them out of slavery, the Hebrews were in slavery and in bondage to the Egyptians. They decided to serve a piece of gold. There's no end to the depravity of the human heart. They wanted their own truth, their own religion, and to fulfill their own desires, not to glorify God himself. And this is, in essence, what really all men do when they reject God. We do it ourselves as Christians. Uh, It's this pride that says, no, I'm good. I got this. I I don't need you. I can do it myself. We struggle with this temptation day to day as believers And this temptation and tension is to resist becoming independent and to allow ourselves to become more and more dependent on God. To not replace God with the things of this world, but to become dependent on Him for our physical needs, our spiritual needs, to be fulfilled in our soul, for our identity, for our purpose, our meaning. Remember answering those questions of origin, meaning, morality, 
and destiny, allowing Christ to do that, not inventing our own. And that's the goal of the Christian walk. More of me. I'm <laughs> more of him, less of me. To let him be strong and to be okay with being weak because in my weakness, he is strong. And this is an old tactic of the enemy. We see it in the fall of man in the Garden of Eden when Satan tempted Eve to believe and trust him above what God had spoken. Also in the account of, of the temptation of Jesus, when Jesus was being tempted in the desert, Satan came to him and said, look, I will give you the kingdoms of the world, again, represented by a city. I'll give you the kingdoms of the world if you'll fall down and worship me. Our worldliness, our, embrace, our embracing of the world and what it says about things and the way it operates is a rejection of God. Here's the deal. What we believe, trust, and delight in is what we are worshiping. What we believe, trust, and delight in is what we are worshiping. And that's why Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So we could say it this way. What we're looking at is what we're treasuring. And what we're treasuring is what we're worshiping. Isn't it interesting that God literally gave Adam and Eve the world? <laughs> literally. He created them and I was like, hey, by the way, I created this round ball. It's huge. You'll probably never get around it. It's yours. He was holding nothing back from them. And what did Satan accuse God of to, to Eve? He accused God of holding back. When in reality, the only thing that God was holding back was death. In the midst of extreme blessing, they believed the lie that God was holding back and that there was something better if they would just disobey. If they just walk according to their own knowledge. Satan did the same thing with Jesus. He promised him the kingdoms of the world if he would disobey God and worship him. And this is what we need to take away that, that God gave Adam and Eve and again to Noah. The world is an inheritance and is a place of communion with himself. And in contrast, Satan promises the world, but in reality wants to deceive us into rejecting that inheritance and embracing earthly kingdoms that worship him. God gave Adam and Eve life and created them perfect and sinless. Satan wanted them to sin and die. God saved humanity through the flood. Satan wanted them to reject the very God that saved them. And they did at the Tower of Babel. So any voice that calls us to re reject God inwardly, we need to take this away today as Christians. Any voice that's calling us to reject God and reject his provision, reject uh, living the way he calls us to live, that is from Satan. Because Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. Okay, so that's a lot. And when we look at all of these stories, this principle of rejecting the way that God sees things and, and, and operating on the world standards and the way that we see things, we see a principle at work in all of this. And it's called pride. We see this at the Tower of Babel, which played out in this form of pagan idolatry. And I, by the way, idolatry is not some antiquated, antiqu antiquated thing that has vanished. Van Good night. Can't talk. It's not this antiquated thing that has vanished. We do it ourselves. Thank God we have a gracious God that leads us out of that. Um, the root of their sin and ours, consequently, at the Tower of Babel was pride. They rejected God and embraced themselves as God. The cause of idolatry or the rejection of God's authority on any area and any issue, specifically today talking about racism, to reject God's authoritative word on that is pride. I want to read you a quote uh, from npr.org. 
Uh, it's going to mention the seven deadly sins in this article, and we get this list of the seven deadly sins from Scripture. Uh, so just know that that's something that they're referencing. Pride has been called the sin from which all others arise. Of the seven deadly sins, theologians and philosophers reserve a special place for pride. Lust, envy, anger, greed, gluttony, and sloth, they are all bad, but pride is the deadliest of all and the root of all evil and the beginning of sin. It's not hard to prove this. The Bible gives us an account of Satan falling himself. From a timeline perspective, this is the first sin that the Bible records. And the Bible gives us an amazing description of how God created Satan originally. He was an archangel. He was one of God's angels. And, and I can't remember if it's in Isaiah or, honestly, I don't know what book it is. But God gives a description of how beautiful he created Satan and awesome and then it says that pride was found in him. Pride is the first original sin that we see biblically. And even Satan committed. It's no wonder Satan knows the root of all evil. And if he can get us to be prideful, that is a common ground that he can let it manifest in any way that he can get it to, that he can tempt, it to, tempt us to let it manifest in our lives. And we need to understand that. That's going to come up again later when we kind of self-examine that issue of pride. So let's read again, starting in verse 5. It says, And the Lord, remember, they, they built a city, a tower. They made a name for themselves. And uh, they wanted to be together, not be dispersed. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Now, this is not God saying, we need to understand this clearly, this is not God saying, if the humans keep going, they're going to overrun me, and somehow they're going to overpower God. That's not what's happening here, and that's not what God is speaking against. God is saying they have opened Pandora's box through embracing pride at such an extreme degree that any evil they, that's out there is going to be possible for them to walk into and start committing any evil. And that's what we need to understand is, is what he's saying. Nothing will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. Now, this is interesting. Let us we see this principle of the Trinity, the triune God, God in three persons, right? Same thing was mentioned in the book of Genesis when it said, let us create man in our own image. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He says, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. The principal effect of sin is separation. What is brokenness? Separation. The principal effect of operating and doing things that are against the way God created them, the principal effect, the consequential effects, is brokenness. That's what sin is. When God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of that fruit that I told you not to eat of, you'll surely die. It didn't mean that they were going to die physically. They experienced spiritual death because they were separated from God. And separation happens within the relationships involved in the sin. It happens within the contextual relationships. And so when a, when a spouse has an affair, what happens? That relationship is broken. What happens when you don't pay your electricity? <laughs> that relationship is broken. They turn it off. It's a principle of doing things that are wrong. You experience brokenness within the contextual Relationships, And so we need to understand that this confusion that happened is God separating the people. This is the consequential sin, or the consequences of the sin that they embrace. This is the brokenness. God's intent was never to create all of these languages. He wanted us to fill the earth in unity, to be his people, one people, one race, Adam's race. Let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there 
over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name is called <coughs> Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over all the face of the earth. You know, it's interesting, as, as God does this, I just can't help but think that even in God's judgment upon the people, that there's a, a bit of mercy. That he's saying, look, no matter, you have now gone down this path that will lead you into all kinds of evils. And yes, I'm going to execute judges, judgment, but I'm going to try to keep you from going down that path. And so even though there was judgment, there is mercy. And only God can hold both of those in his hands. Only God can do that. Um, and we also get, uh, see God laying out again his plan for them to disperse and to fill the earth to not make a name for themselves but to enjoy what he has created and done um, again this, the, the desire for, God, for, for God's people to go on uh, throughout the earth was to be in unity this issue that we see of racism this division um, is just a re-manifestation of pride. And so we go, what does all this have to do with this issue of racism, this sliver of society that has just exploded and been inflamed? Um, what does all this have to do with racism? It's that sin has unintended consequences, and the people of Tower of Babel uh, now made way for what we see as racism. The Tower of Babel may not have been the origin of races, as we have seen, but it was the origin of divisions in the tongues and people groups, and this made way for pr the pride of sinful man to eventually bring about what we now know as, as racism. Racism is just pride repackaged, remanifested, remanifesting itself in a radical ideology that's so far away from what God has created us to be. So even though racism is just one of the evils that plague mankind, we see clearly at the Tower of Babel that that's the point in human history where the grounds for such an evil to take root were brought into existence by their consequential sin. We're going to talk a little bit about what racism is like for us because... I mean, let's be honest, nobody's out, we're, nobody's out there uh, in a KKK suit. At least I don't know any of y'all that are doing that. No one's out there uh, shoving people off cliffs, hanging people, doing the extreme acts that we have seen racism uh, do throughout the centuries. So what does it look like for us? What, is this, what does it look like for us to address this issue in our own lives? And that's where we really need to bring this home. Um, what, what do we need to take away from this? Before we do that, though, uh, let me make a statement up front. Um, Derek and I were talking this weekend, so this comes from his heart. And this is something that we want to communicate to you as the church. Um, we have really wrestled with how to present the information uh, on this topic and in this series because what we don't want to do is paint with too large of a brush and speak in such a way that assumes and makes it sound like everybody's a racist. And, and in nature, accuse people that may or may not be guilty of that, uh, or that may not be guilty of that, and have that issue. Um, that is not our intention. Uh, what we do want to challenge everybody to do within this series, this is it, this is the heart. We want to challenge everybody to take the time to humbly, not pridefully, humbly examine themselves and to pray what the psalmist prayed in 139 verses 23 and 24 when he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. This is our prayer as a church. Um, I also think it might be helpful for me, helpful for me as a person who's been redeemed and, and being continually redeemed of this type of prideful thinking, I, I do want to share my experience in dealing with this issue because I've had to deal with it. 
I've had to deal with these prejudices within my heart. And I'm sad to say that, but you know what? We're all, we're all sinful. Um, I remember there's a point in my relationship with the Lord a few years back where he began to reveal to me that I had these thoughts, these tendencies, these feelings, these uh, ways of thinking that he began to put a name on. It was racism. And uh, I remember I confessed that to a friend one time. And I said, I really feel like the Lord's been showing me I've, I've been racist in my thinking and my feelings. And um, what's interesting is the pride in me rose up and began to try to justify that and make it logical. So even though I confessed it to a friend, I didn't confess it in a way that was ready to let it go. Um, I began to tell the, so what I began to do is make up this case like, well, you know, it's not that I don't love the people, it's just that I don't like their culture. It's not that I don't like the people or love the people, it's like I don't like the way they do things. And I began to make up this, these excuses that really in my, in my heart I knew was just a lie. Yeah, I don't have to embrace the culture of other people, but I knew at the end of the day those two things were one. And I was rejecting the people. Um, and so the Lord began to show me that the root of what I was thinking was this prejudice. Racism grows out of the soil of prejudice. That's the first, that's the infancy of, what, of racism as an adult. And uh, once I, once I, I confessed it truly and acknowledged that it was wrong all the way to the root, I didn't just call the branches evil and try to keep the tree around. I called the whole thing rotten all the way to the root. And once I did that and said, Lord, I don't know how to change my heart. I don't know how to think differently. I don't know how to bring about uh, the change of heart that I know needs to happen to be able to love people without seeing all of the exterior stuff. Um, the Lord is so graceful and gracious because he didn't leave me there. I didn't have to change my heart. I had to, I had to repent and to confess, and the Lord changed my heart. The Lord began to give me... Uh, knowledge and understanding of what he says about people and that they are one with me. And so I was able to see myself on a, on a level playing ground. I was able to see people in myself the way that God sees, the way that God sees us. And I mean, I, honestly, I felt like since that time, uh, I felt like the Grinch, you know, the Grinch who stole Christmas after he stole all the toys. He's up there on the mountain. He's trying to hold the the sled up from falling off the mountain because he's had this change of heart and he realizes he's done something wrong and he's standing there holding this and he sent, here's Cindy Lou Who, da, boo, da, you know, the Whoville. And they hear all of this and his heart begins to swell. And it's not about anything that he did. But God brought about the tools and the material for his heart to change. And now he was able to carry this burden which he was just trying to hold it away from being a train wreck in his life. And that's what I felt like. I was just trying to hold this thing at bay to where it blended in and people didn't see it. But God gave me the tools for my heart to grow, to be able to embrace people and to love people um, of different color, to be able to see a culture that I, I don't agree with, but not let that affect my love for them. Because um, again, the Lord doesn't just judge our actions. He judges our motives and our intentions, our thoughts and our feelings. That's why he said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adul adultery. It's not the sexual act that's adultery. It's your heart. If you have been angry with your brother, you have committed murder. Again, not the action, the heart. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. If you're prejudiced in your heart and your feelings against people, then you've committed racism. 
So again, our desire is not to paint with this broad stroke and call everybody in here a racist. I, this is my, that's my story. But I only share that with you in hopes that you will take the time to look past and go, yeah, I may not be doing the, ra- the radical, heinous acts of racism, but that you'll take the time and go through the labor of allowing the spirit to just reveal the subtleties of heart. Because that's where it lies with most of us. That's where it lies with most of us.